tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses, which are home to over 50,000 students, ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it, to nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed a tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help, and innovate against all odds. To grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink, to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference, and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter. Colleagues, friends and the audience internationally, good day. Um, I am Norman Duncan, Vice Principal Academic at the University of Pretoria and it is my privilege to chair this public's lecture that will be presented by US Judge Wendell Griffin. As indicated in the program, the lecture has been organized and is jointly hosted by the Faculty of Theology and Religion and the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria. As also indicated in the program, uh, Judge Wendell Griffin will present a 30-minute lecture titled Vaccination or Not? religious and legal perspective. Of course, uh, the issue of vaccination um, is very topical at this point in time and it is the source of much debate in many contexts throughout the world. Now, Judge um, uh, Griffin's lecture will be followed by, firstly, a response by Professor Jerry Pillay, the Dean of our Faculty of Theology and Religion, and thereafter a response by Professor Elsebe Skuman, the Dean of our Faculty of Law. This will be followed by a 25-minute question and answer session involving the audience and the speaker, uh, Judge Wendell Griffin, as well as the respondents, Professor Pillay and Professor Skuman. Firstly, however, I wish to hand over to Professor Alan Buzak so that he can formally introduce uh, Judge Griffin. Allow me to note here, however, that it is of course only fitting that Professor Buzak introduces Judge Griffin given that it is he who first suggested this lecture and lecture series uh, that, uh, that this lecture forms part of. And Professor Buzak joins us from Cape Town. Over to you, Professor Buzak. Thank you, uh, Professor Norman Duncan. And good evening, colleagues. Good morning, friends everywhere. I have read the bio of Judge Wendell Griffin, judge and pastor. Our speaker for the two lectures arranged by the faculties of law and religion and the faculty of theology. A legal scholar and practitioner, Wendell Griffin is also a Baptist pastor, a board member of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, author of a book titled The Fierce Urgency of Prophetic Hope, and just as fierce a blogger on his two blogs, Wendell Griffin on cultural competence and justice is a verb. What the bio tells us is that Wendell Griffin was born and raised near the town of Delight in Pike County, Arkansas, in the Southern United States. What the bio does not tell us is that that means growing up in the deep South, a dark place for black people at a very dark time for black people in the United States. 
What the bio does not tell us is what that meant for an African-American in a former slave state still run and controlled by the descendants of slave owners and slave drivers who ran the Jim Crow state of Arkansas and who today are fighting harder than ever to return Arkansas to the times of unbridled white supremacy and black disenfranchisement. What the bio does not tell us is of the endless efforts to keep Arkansas a modernized plantation with a plantation economy, plantation politics, and a plantation mindset. What the bio does tell us is that Judge Griffin grew up in Pike County. But what the bio does not tell us is that Pike County is a neighbor to St. Francis County. The seat of that county is Forest City, named after Nathan Bedford Forrest, a Civil War general accused of war crimes for the massacring of Black Union soldiers, prisoners of war. What the bio does not tell us is that Nathan Bedford Forrest was the founder of the Ku Klux Klan and that Forest City is in St. Francis County named after St. Francis of Assisi. What the bio does not tell us is what that means to live with such painful and glaring contradictions, what it costs to be a righteous judge and a prophetic preacher in Arkansas today. But Wendell Griffin is both. What the bio tells us is that Reverend Wendell Griffin was a brilliant student in a racially segregated school and who after 1965, as a result of the struggles of the courageous civil rights generation stood out and graduated with honors in a desegregated high school. What the bio does not tell us though, is that Arkansas was one of the toughest states to desegregate or that Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, where Judge Wendell Griffin now lives and works, was the scene of one of the fiercest battles for integration following the famous 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. That before the celebrated entry of nine African-American students into a formerly whites only high school, there was the astonishingly brave Elizabeth Eckford who came to that white school, stood alone, facing the hostility, the brutal abuse, and full force of white racist violence on her own. What the bio does not tell us is what that took, the struggle to remain calm and focused in school, the fortitude to endure, the courage to hold on to the vision to overcome and to succeed. When the Griffin is a descendant of these students and their generation, their spirit lives in him and he honors that spirit, their fight and their sacrifices in his continuing struggles for justice, equity and dignity as a judge and as a pastor. So while the bio tells us that Wendell Griffin studied law, became associate editor of the Arkansas Law Review, headed the Race Relations Equal Opportunity Office for the US Army at Fort Carson in Colorado, and was awarded the Army Commendation Medal for that sterling work, and subsequently was elected the highly respected circuit court judge he is today. The bio does not tell us this, that Wendell Griffin achieved all this against incredible odds that he strived and shone because in him he holds, nurtures and cherishes the spirit of a people, though enslaved, never stop resisting their bondage. A people who, though severely oppressed, never stop fighting because they knew that they were not a people meant for slavery and oppression. They were a people destined for justice and dignity and freedom. The bio does tell us, though, that Judge Wendell Griffin is a preacher, and that is how I got to know him. So I also know that the bio does not tell us that he is a preaching standing in the tradition of the prophetic Black church of Denmark Vesey and Nat Turner, of Sojourner Truth and Ida B. Wells, of Martin Luther King Jr. and Ella Baker, and that he steadfastly walks the path of prophetic ministry hand in hand 
with prophets like J. Alfred Smith Jr., Ivor Carruthers, and Jeremiah Wright A. Jr. The bio tells us that Wendell Griffin is a judge. The bio does not tell us that Wendell Griffin is one of that rare breed, a righteous judge, locked into fierce and ongoing battles with the justice systems in his own state because of his stand on the issues of human rights, the death penalty, the integrity of the law, and his insistence that the legal character of the law should be held against the light of the moral rectitude of the law. When what the bio tells us is that Wendell Griffin is married to clinical psychologist, Dr. Patricia Griffin, and that the couple are the parents of two adult sons. But the bio does not tell us how much he loves them and is inspired by them. So this, my colleagues and friends, is the man the judge, scholar, activist, and the preacher, pastor, prophet, I am blessed to know and humbled to call my friend who is our speaker for today. So please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you, Prof. Buzak. Thank you for your very kind words. Professor Duncan, Dean Pillay, Dean Schumann, thank you and Professor Buzak for the blessing of this invitation to collaborate with you. And good day, good evening to those of you from South Africa, good day to those of us who are on my side of the Atlantic. And, uh, I thank you one and all for the opportunity to be part of this gathering. I thank Professor Buzak for his kind words and his wonderful friendship. Uh, I consider him not only a brother beloved, but also a mentor. And I consider myself much like one of his students because I am constantly prodded. Uh, I am constantly pricked and constantly pushed I remember now how it felt being a law student, the first years of law school and being challenged by my law professors. And Professor Buzak does the same thing to me when we talk on our Skype conversations and when I read his wonderful work. I am blessed by the invitation to talk about vaccination or not, religious and legal perspectives. And I thank Dean Pillay and Dean Schumann for choosing this topic and for the one we will pursue later this, this year uh, on, the, on a similar subject. To begin, two years ago, and it seems very much short now, the term COVID-19 was not part of our vocabulary most people would have stumbled in speaking the word novel coronavirus. The world had survived bouts with influenza and Ebola virus in prior years, but the infectious disease experts, public health officials, physicians, politicians, lawyers, judges, courts, journalists, and everyone else, everyone else, in the world did not know about COVID-19. Why? It did not exist in September, 2019. Two years later, COVID-19 defines how we live, how we move, work, study, worship, entertain, and conduct the other rituals of existence from birth through death. What began as a new viral infection in one province in China, spread across that nation, spanned the world in a manner of weeks and made global and globalism real in new and very challenging ways. Scientists and medical professionals worked harder and faster than ever before to develop a vaccine for this highly infectious easily transmissible and lethal 
respiratory virus. A year ago, the best the world could hope was that researchers would succeed in developing, testing, and producing a vaccine by late fall or early winter 2020. Believe it or not, that was our hope as short as a year ago. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was hospitalized for a week and spent three days in intensive care after he was sickened by COVID in April 2020. In late September 2020, almost a year ago now, US President Donald Trump was sickened by COVID-19 and flown to a hospital where he was treated for 72 hours. These examples show that 12 months ago, world leaders were as vulnerable to COVID-19 infection as anyone else. By December 2020, when the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccines were approved for emergency use, more than a million people had died throughout the world from COVID-related causes. Given that history, one would have welcomed opportunity. One would have expected people to welcome opportunity to receive a vaccine to protect themselves from the most lethal biological threat to human life in more than 100 years. However, vaccine hesitancy, meaning delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite availability of vaccination services, is a common phenomenon around the world. As one researcher states, quote, Factors that affect the attitude towards acceptance of vaccination include complacency, convenience, and confidence. Complacency denotes the low perception of the disease risk. Hence, vaccination was deemed unnecessary. Confidence refers to the trust in vaccination safety, effectiveness, besides the competence of the healthcare systems. Convenience entails the availability, affordability, and delivery of vaccines in a comfortable context. People who are complacent about the risk of becoming infected with the COVID-19 virus are less likely to be vaccinated, regardless to the evidence about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine, and no matter how readily they may be able to obtain it. People who distrust the safety and efficacy of the vaccine and who distrust the competence and good faith of healthcare systems are less likely to be vaccinated despite knowing the risk of COVID-19 disease, even if a vaccine is accessible, available, affordable, and comfortably accessible. And even when people recognize the lethal risk associated with COVID disease, trust the vaccine to be safe and effective and trust healthcare providers to deliver the vaccine competently. They are less likely to be vaccinated if a vaccine is not available, affordable, and cannot be delivered in a comfortable way. The SARS-19 coronavirus does not respect geography, ideology, social status, and the other things that are commonly viewed as why humans differ among ourselves. In the face of this common viral threat, humanity is confronted by hesitancy to accept vaccination that has been proven safe and predictably effective at preventing serious suffering and death from sickness caused by the SARS-19 coronavirus. My presentation explores the legal and religious factors surrounding vaccine hesitancy. And when I think of religious factors, I'm referring to how society exercises power to influence personal behavior that bears on public health in the face of vaccine hesitancy. By religious factors, I mean how systems of moral and ethical belief influence personal behavior that bears on public health in the face of vaccine hesitancy. My premise is that vaccine hesitancy cannot be confronted and overcome without considering how systems of societal power and religious belief influence how humans define our individual and communal existence and behavior. Law, of course, deals with the exercise of societal power. Religion deals with the exercise of moral and ethical power. My premise is that vaccine hesitancy can be affected by both those forces. And the questions surrounding this premise are not hypothetical, they are quite real. As I was preparing this presentation, President Joe Biden announced that the United States would regulate, would mandate rather, using the authority of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, 
commonly known as OSHA, to regulate workplace healthy health and safety, that all private companies in the US with more than 100 employees require vaccination or weekly testing of their workers. Mr. Biden also ordered mandatory vaccination for nearly 300,000 educators in the federally run schools and in the federally run Head Start program and at more than 200 federally run schools. As one might expect, reaction to Biden's announcement varied depending on partisan political affiliation. The editorial board of the New York Times and the Washington Post have endorsed vaccination mandates and weekly testing for COVID-19. However, in a column published in the Washington Post, one commentator denounced Biden's decision to impose vaccine mandates as an unconstitutional federal intrusion concerning state powers and individual freedom. And Republican politicians across the United States who oppose vaccine mandates also expressed outrage at Biden's intention announcement and have declared their intention to challenge it in the courts. And although major religious de denominations have announced their support for COVID vaccines, individuals in the US are citing personal faith as the basis for refusing to be vaccinated. Now societies across the world have long exercised the power to mandate that people be vaccinated to prevent the harms that result when they are infected by and transmit communicable diseases. This power has been recognized and exercised in societies that have widely varying systems of government, widely varying systems of religion, and has been recognized and exercised in those societies, even in the face of vaccine hesitancy. Neither concerns about the limits of governmental power, nor whether mandating vaccines infringes on personal liberty, have blocked societies from issuing and enforcing vaccine mandates. Instead, societies have balanced the interests of public health and safety with respect for individual liberty. Where vaccination is mandated, Societies have recognized exceptions based on religious faith if unvaccinated persons do not threaten public health. And the Biden vaccine mandate announcement is an example. Workers who are not vaccinated will be required to undergo weekly testing for COVID-19. In that sense, the weekly testing option is an accommodation to people who cannot be vaccinated, either due to health issues or based on religious objections. I maintain, therefore, that vaccine hesitancy is not affected by whether governments have the power to mandate vaccination, nor is the phenomenon of vaccine hesitancy driven by whether and how health and personal liberty, including religious liberty, of unvaccinated persons are accommodated. The power to mandate vaccinations includes the power to accommodate individual health and liberty concerns in ways that do not jeopardize public health and safety. And there is nothing new about societal regulation of individual behavior, even when the behavior that's regulated does not in and of itself threaten others. Public land, for instance, can be appropriated for public purposes as long as landowners receive just compensation for the land, even when landowners object to it being used for those purposes, and even when they dispute the purchase price offered by the state to acquire. More specifically, governmental power to regulate automobile, automobile safety is the basis for automobiles being sold with seat belts that must be worn and alarm systems that must be present to alert drivers to fasten the seat belts, even for car owners who prefer automobiles without seat belts, without alarms, and who consider a governmental mandate to wear seat belts an infringement on their personal liberty. Societal power to regulate individual behavior in the interest of public health and safety is as old as laws against robbing, killing, raping, and cheating others. While some religions have considerations, concerns, restrictions about vaccinations in general and reasons for vaccination or specific vaccine ingredients, most religions do not prohibit vaccinations. The Jehovah's Witness sect originally denounced vaccination, but revised its doctrine in 1952. 
almost 70 years ago. The sect now affirms that whether someone is vaccinated is a personal decision and that vaccinations are not prohibited by scripture. Because vaccine mandates include religious exceptions, the mandates do not infringe on religious freedom because those people who have those objections are given accommodations. So intellectual honesty compels us to admit that current expressions of vaccine hesitancy based on opposition to vaccine mandates are not grounded in threats to, to personal liberty or religious expression. Instead, they are objections to the idea that Howard Thurman termed, quote, the experience of universality that makes all class and race distinctions impertinent, close quote. They are open warfare against the idea that Martin Luther King Jr. often expressed when he said, quote, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Close quote. Now Thurman and King were Baptist preachers, black Baptist preachers in the religion of Jesus. Neither man held public office or wielded governmental power. Their appeal, however, is echoed by President Biden and other political leaders who recognize, at least concerning COVID-19 and the global pandemic, that idolatry to personal liberty and personal privilege threatens communal health and safety. Vaccine mandates challenge the Cain-like attitude that personal freedom and power can be used to the detriment of others with impunity. Implicitly, vaccine mandates affirm a value cherished throughout the world in every religion and affirmed by every legal and political system. That value system holds that all people are neighbors. It holds that each of us owes a duty to not harm other persons. Each of us deserves protection from self-centered people who choose to exercise their personal freedom in ways that threaten others. President Biden and other politicians do not attribute their decisions to mandate vaccinations to religious concerns. Their concerns are utilitarian. They want to protect people from being infected, sickened, and from dying from COVID-19 so schools and businesses can remain open, and so workers can be paid to produce goods and provide services. Nevertheless, the political and economic benefits from vaccine mandates do not invalidate the moral and ethical grounds to support such mandates. Instead, Biden and other politicians who support mandates show that reverence for the interconnectedness of all humanity produces positive results. No group in a population will be safe from the threat of COVID-19 unless the entire population is safe. No society will be safe until the whole world is safe. The universality of experience that Howard Thurman extolled and the inescapable network of mutuality that King preached about make vaccine mandates political, economic, moral, and ethical imperatives. President Biden and other politicians may not say so, but COVID-19 is providentially exposing the world to the consequences of disregarding the moral and ethical pleas and admonitions and warnings of Thurman, King, and other prophetic voices. We are seeing what happens when people refuse to obey the love your neighbor as yourself values that have been the bedrock of justice and peace throughout the world. And in that sense, much of the opposition to vaccine mandates shows how moral incompetence, I say again, moral incompetence, threatens human survival. Remember, a year ago, there was no vaccine available in the world to treat this highly transmissible and life-threatening disease. Now, Although free vaccines are available across the United States, people are refusing to be vaccinated and some politicians in so-called red states, including in Arkansas where I live, openly object to vaccines being required. 
It is heartbreaking, to put bluntly, to know that people are becoming infected, sickened, and risk dying because they refuse to be vaccinated, refuse to wear a mask, and refuse to follow health admonitions to practice social distancing. In this sense, opponents to vaccine mandates who profess to believe in the sanctity of human embryos are hypocrites. It is hard to take people seriously who assert that embryos deserve governmental protection from abortion while they try to prevent governmental vaccine mandates that protect people from becoming infected, sick, and dying from COVID-19. But the vitriolic opposition to vaccine mandates in the United States is more than hypocritical and hubristic when one considers its consequences for human health and safety. When one considers the health and safety implications of that opposition on vulnerable persons, and especially on children, the opposition to vaccine mandates takes on a heinous character. Remember, the issues surrounding vaccine hesitancy are complacency, confidence, and convenience. Now, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has given full approval to the vaccines for COVID-19. Vaccine mandate opponents have not produced any evidence showing that the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson Johnson vaccines are unsafe and ineffective therapies to protect people from becoming infected with the SARS coronavirus and prevent serious illness and death in those rare occasions when breakthrough infections occur. Vaccine mandates do not argue that health professionals lack the competence to administer the vaccines. People in the United States have better access to free, safe, effective, and properly administered vaccines for COVID-19 than anyone else in the world. Paradoxically, the United States leads the world in the number of COVID-19 deaths among industrialized nations. So it is hard and heartbreaking to observe so many across the US who are willing to let that nation's unvaccinated children pass through the fire of the COVID-19 variants by refusing to vaccinate themselves and by opposing vaccine mandates. And much of the vaccine resistance is taking place among so-called Christian conservatives who are rejecting a vaccine that will protect themselves from the sickening and lethal effects of the COVID-19 coronavirus, despite pleas from respected scientists and physicians, including scientists and physicians who are followers of Jesus. More than 650,000 people in the United States have died because of COVID-19. That number has now gotten to over 670,000. The Delta variant can infect people who've been vaccinated, though breakthrough cases remain exceptional and are without the extensive sickness and risk of death that occurs when unvaccinated persons are infected. And here's the big point. Currently, none of the existing vaccines for COVID-19 have been approved for children 12 years old and younger. With this population still at risk for contracting COVID-19, one would think that people who love and want to protect defenseless children from becoming infected and sickened would receive vaccinations and support vaccine mandates. Medical and scientific experts urge that vaccinated people wear face masks to protect themselves from exposure to COVID-19. However, Many of the same people who object to vaccine mandates are also objecting to wearing face masks and object to governmental mandates that face masks be worn. They are doing so, mind you, while the Delta, Delta, Delta variant spreads like wildfire throughout the United States, causing sickness, suffering, hospitalizations, and deaths of unvaccinated adults and children. Just last month, the United States Supreme Court invalidated an eviction moratorium issued by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 among unsheltered persons. Consequently, now millions of unvaccinated adults and children face the prospect of homelessness or taking shelter in communal housing arrangements without the benefit of space and social distance, 
or a mandate to wear a mask. In addition, including mandates that masks be worn in schools. And so unvaccinated and unmasked children now sit in crowded classrooms. Some of them have been infected with the Delta variant and are infecting schoolmates, teachers, and staff workers. The infected students, teachers, and school staff workers take the Delta variant home and into their neighborhoods, thereby exposing other persons, including elders, to the risk of infection. And in this sense, the vitriolic opposition to vaccine and mass mandates reminds me of the ancient worship of Molech. We are causing children to pass through or walk into a fire called the COVID-19 Delta variant. Children are being sickened and dying because people who claim to love God and believe in personal liberty refuse to be vaccinated and wear face masks. The American Academy of Pediatrics, Pediatricians has reported that after declining during the early part of the summer, child cases of COVID-19 increased exponentially with more than 750,000 child cases of COVID-19 added between August 5 and September 2. About 252,000 child cases were added the last week of August alone. People who deliberately expose children to the risk of sickness and death by refusing to wear masks, by discouraging others from wearing masks, and by refusing to be vaccinated are not honoring life. They are not protecting children. They're not loving God. They're not loving their neighbors. They are sacrificing children, much like religious people did who practiced the ancient, ancient idolatry of worship and Molech. And the fact that they do so in the name of personal liberty and religious freedom shows the hypocritical, hubristic, and idolatrous perverseness of American exceptionalism. At a time when the entire human population is threatened by a viral pandemic that can be stopped if adults are vaccinated, wear face masks, and practice social distancing, politicians and religious people in the society with the greatest supply and access to free, safe, and effective vaccines for the SARS-19 coronavirus are insisting that people who can receive vaccines are legally and morally entitled to refuse vaccines, refuse to wear face masks, and congregate at will because they are Americans. An appreciable amount of their opposition to vaccine mandates is fueled by social media and other deliberate exercises in disinformation, disinformation and societal disharmony. In 1979, the E.F. Hutton investment firm marketed itself on television with a commercial in which someone would mention that E.F. Hutton was managing their assets. And immediately, people near that speaker would stop what they were doing to overhear the conversation, leading to this catchy end of the commercial. Quote, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen, close quote. Sadly, people are not listening to the warnings about COVID-19. The surging tide of infection, sickness, hospitalization, and death because of the COVID-19 pandemic prompts one to question why people have failed to heed warnings, instructions, and pleas from physicians and public health experts about how we should behave to protect ourselves. And it highlights the moral incompetence of people who oppose vaccine mandates. According to the biblical book of Proverbs, simple people are easily misled because they do not recognize the difference between what is good and true and what is harmful and false. Scoffers scorn knowledge, truth, warning, and pleas that will prevent them from danger. And in doing so, they expose themselves and those around them to unnecessary risk of harm. Fools are moral idiots who expose themselves and others to harm because they do not use good judgment. And the message of Proverbs 
is that humans live in a moral universe where the principle of cause and effect is as real as it is in the physical universe. People who are simple, scoffers, and fools behave as if that is not true. Meanwhile, they don't want to be reminded of the consequences of living that way. They do not want to heed appeals to behave in ways they dislike. When their conduct results in misfortune, they dislike hearing the words, I told you so. We want the freedom to make mistakes, but do not want to be told when we have ignored counsel that could have avoided being mistaken. We want the freedom to take risks, but don't want to be reminded that we were warned that the conduct we intentionally took would be unsuccessful or worse yet, harmful. We want to be recognized for making decisions that work out well, but we do not want people to tell us or others about the decision we made that did not work after we were told that they would not work or they would work in unpleasant ways. We don't like to be reminded when we've been wrong. Each of us is vulnerable to what behavioral scientists call the self-serving bias, the tendency to take credit for our successes, but to deflect blame for our failures. Yet the ability to learn from our mistakes requires the humility to admit that we make mistakes. We goof, we ignore warnings, we blow it. The ability to recognize that truth is essential if people to avoid self-inflicted harms and other consequences associated with simple-mindedness, scornful disregard for truth, and moral idiocy. Regardless of one's political, religious, or other beliefs, the consequences of moral incompetence are painful, preventable, and deserved. Like it or not, there is no exception or exemption to the principle of cause and effect. In the same way, there is no exemption or exception from the law of gravity for people who are simple, scornful, and fools. People reap the effects of their conduct. People who plant peanuts, for example, cannot expect and do not deserve to harvest potatoes. At some point, people who are simple scoffers and fools are stuck with the consequences of moral incompetence. They are stuck with the results of ignoring or rejecting appeals to wake up, heed wise instructions, and live differently. At that point, they must suffer the consequences of their simple mindedness, their scornfulness, and their foolishness. We are witnessing the bitter fruit of moral incompetence surrounding COVID-19 every day. Some people have been infected, sickened, hospitalized, and died who said they did not need to wear a mask and be vaccinated because God would not let them be infected with COVID. Children are being infected, sickened, and are dying because adults refuse to wear masks and be vaccinated. People are ridiculing medical and public health leaders who plead that we wear a mask, plead that we practice social distancing, and plead that we be vaccinated. Unmasked people by the tens of thousands are flocking and breathing on each other for hours in stadiums, watching sporting events, weeks after such gatherings were prohibited by the Olympics, at the Olympics, in open defiance of police to wear a mask, practice social distancing, and be vaccinated. People are deliberately purchasing and ingesting ivermectin, a drug prescribed to dewarm farm animals but which has never been tested or approved to treat or prevent COVID-19, rather than taking medically tested vaccines that have been proven to be safe and effective. Meanwhile, the death toll from COVID-19 is surging. Children who cannot be vaccinated are being infected at an alarming rate. Hospitals are overcrowded. Healthcare workers are worn out. Funeral directors overwhelmed. Our analysis of vaccine mandates and vaccine hesitancy requires that we address the pervasive moral incompetence surrounding COVID-19. Simply put, vaccine mandates are lawful. Vaccine mandates do not infringe on religious freedom. But as Professor Alan Buzak has said, the time for pious words is over. The suffering and death experienced throughout the world from the SARS-19 coronavirus and COVID-19 disease 
is being worsened, not merely because so many people are behaving like simpletons, scoffers, and fools. Their moral incompetence is being deliberately weaponized by self-serving politicians. A recent article in the New York Times reports that Republican politicians in Alabama, Arkansas, my home state, Arizona, Florida, Idaho, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, and other US states know that vaccine mandates are lawful because their states have long mandated vaccination to prevent infection and transmission of communicable diseases. Hence, their opposition to vaccine mandates does not require legal, scientific, medical, or public policy analysis and explanation. Rather, their opposition demands the prophetic discernment, explanation, denouncement, and condemnation often found in scripture as exemplified by the prophet Isaiah, who warned that the Lord's hand was not too short to save nor his ear too dull to hear, but that the iniquities of people had been a barrier between them and their God. And specifically, the prophet said, your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one brings suit justly. No one goes to law justly, honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies, conceiving mischief and begetting iniquity. Their feet run to evil and they rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are of iniquity. The way of peace they do not know and there is no justice in their paths. Their roads they have made crooked. No one who walks in them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We wait for light and lo, there is darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope like blind along a wall, groping like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight, among the vigorous as though we were dead. We all growl like bears, like doves, we moan mournfully. We wait for justice, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. That's prophetic speech. The prophet writes, justice is turned back and righteousness turns, stands at a distance, for truth stumbles in the public square and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and whoever turns from evil is despoiled. Another Hebrew prophet, Micah, analyzed the words, the problems in words that although different are similarly indicting. Micah writes, Alas for those who devise wickedness and evil deeds on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in their power. Professor Buzak has brilliantly expounded on and provided an incisive and succinct analysis of the abusive power machinations at work that are exposed in those passages and particularly in the passage from Micah, in the following excerpt from his 2015 book, Kairos, Crisis, and Global Apartheid, The Challenge to Prophetic Resistance. Professor Buzek writes, quote, Micah teaches us that prophetic judgment is not emotional ranting and raving. He is meticulous as he lists the evils that those who oppress the poor love. They devise wickedness and evil deeds in their beds. That is, they think of nothing else all night long. And when morning dawns, they perform it. This should give us pause. First, Micah offers sober insight into the human psyche. Unlike animals reacting on instincts for self-preservation and survival, humans contemplate the evil they wreck on others. They plan exploitation and oppression. They calculate the profits and benefits of war and destruction. They design the language of justification, obfuscation, and trivialization, collateral damage, enhanced interrogation techniques. We tortured some folks. There is nothing spontaneous about it. 
Then Micah adds with amazing insight into the workings of power, ancient and modern, because it is in their power. This is what lies at the core of their evil doing, raw, abusive power. There is no fuzziness, naivete, no ambiguity about this. It is pure, naked, abusive power, close quote. The politicians in the US, in Alabama, in Arkansas, Arizona, Florida, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, elsewhere, oppose vaccine mandates knowing that the mandates are lawful. They know hospitals in their states have intensive care units filled with unvaccinated and intubated COVID-19 patients. Those politicians know that people needing emergency treatment for diseases, for conditions like heart attacks and strokes are being ferreted hundreds of miles away from the nearest hospital because the hospitals in their vicinities are crowded and full of COVID patients. Those politicians are now planning lawsuits and other maneuvers to challenge vaccine mandates. They are designing and fabricating public appearances where they falsely blame vaccine mandates for vaccine hesitancy. And they are doing it, as Micah observed, and as Professor Buzek emphasized, because it is in their power. Likewise, so-called religious leaders, Christian conservative leaders, oppose vaccine mandates, knowing that religious exemptions are provided, knowing that the option of weekly testing for COVID is an alternative to being vaccinated, knowing that employers are obligated to make reasonable accommodations for persons who object on religious grounds. As with the politicians, these religious leaders oppose the vaccine mandates and foment opposition to efforts to encourage compliance with the mandates because it is in their power. And the conduct of those politicians and religious leaders goes beyond being merely simple, scornful, and foolish. It is more than hypocritical. It is more than hubristic. It is more than arrogant. It is self-righteous, self-serving, and self-worshipping. Simply put, it is diabolical. It is a special work of prophetic persons to say so. Courts and judges can declare COVID-19 vaccine mandates lawful. Physicians can attest that vaccines for COVID-19 are safe and effective. Physicians and nurses can administer the vaccines. But the work of exposing, denouncing, and condemning the diabolical conduct of politicians and religious leaders who are falsely opposing vaccine mandates belongs to prophetic people. Hence, Professor Buzak draws our attention to the repeated denunciation of hypocrites by Jesus at Matthew 23. Recall that at Matthew 23, Jesus repeatedly called the religious elites of his time hypocrites. That's the chapter where he called the people hypocrites, blind hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, deal, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. That's prophetic talk. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so the outside can become, become clean. Woe to you, you snakes, you brood of vipers. How can you escape being sent to hell? That's Jesus talking. That's in the red letters. Professor Buzak, a prophetic scholar, preacher, and activist, observes that looking at what Jesus said in Matthew 23, such hypocrisy is never harmless. Instead, Professor Buzak reminds us, quote, that is one reason why Jesus in Matthew 23 so repeatedly called the Jerusalem elites who held the power of life or death over the heads of the vulnerable 
hypocrites. Hypocrisy is not simply a face we put on. What we are hiding, Jesus says, looking at this through the eyes of hypocrisy's victims, is a calculated lethal intent, a choice to turn away from the God of life to the gods of death. Hypocrisy equals idolatry, equals service to Moloch, equals human sacrifice, especially and, is, and specifically children, close quote. Time will tell whether politicians, judges, religious leaders, and others who are influential in the United States will exercise the moral competence, including the courage, to confront the hypocrisy, the misinformation, and disinformation surrounding vaccine mandates. Time will tell whether people will stop using political and religious excuses to avoid receiving the protection from free COVID vaccination. Time will tell whether the society that boasts that it is powerful and just and reverent will heed prophetic calls to love our neighbors as ourselves. And time will tell how many woes the world will suffer because efforts to overcome COVID-19 are being frustrated by people in the United States who are simple scoffers and fools and who are followers of the idolatry of American exceptionalism. Beyond that, time will tell whether prophetic people will, like prophetic people such as Jesus, Micah, and Isaiah in ancient, and like present day prophets such as Professor Buzak, recognize, denounce, and condemn the diabolical hypocrisy surrounding opposition to vaccine mandates for COVID-19. Just as Jesus denounced the hellish hypocrisy in Matthew 23, the work of exposing the hellish hypocrisy of opportunistic politicians and self-serving religious people who oppose vaccine mandates in the name of personal freedom, including religious liberty, belongs to prophetic people. And the fate of the world turns on whether prophetic people come forth and speak that truth. Thank you for giving me this listen. Thank you so much for that um, very instructive presentation, uh, Judge Griffin. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Jerry Pillay, our Dean of our Faculty of Theology and Religion, to do the first response to Professor, uh, to Judge Griffin's um, uh, presentation. Over to you, Prof Pillay. Thank you, Professor Duncan. I would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to Judge uh, Griffin for a very thought-provoking and powerful address. Of course, the position he has taken in relation to the topic of vaccination or not is a resounding and convincing yes to the vaccine. Yet while this is the case, the lecture reflects quite adequately on the position taken by those who advocate a strong no to vaccines. Although it does not go into an in-depth exploration and analysis of the no view, yet it carefully mentions them to speak in favor of vaccines. Let me put my position up front. As a fully vaccinated person, I am in absolute support of vaccines and would therefore enthusiastically support Judge Wendell's position and views about the same. We are going through a global pandemic in which we have seen millions upon millions of people being infected and millions even dying. The realities of our different contexts do not just require, but demands a response that is helpful and urgent if we are to save and protect lives and livelihoods. And in this sense, the vaccines are an essential aspect of arresting the spread of the disease and saving lives. While we know that taking the vaccine does not necessarily prevent infection, but it does make the illness less severe. And there are numerous scientific evidences to support this. In responding to Judge Griffin's lecture, I would like to make the following remarks. One, 
He started off by showing the broad scope of the global coronavirus crisis. Even some of the world leaders, as he has mentioned, have been infected. Indeed, this is the case. If we look into just the South African context, we get a fair reflection of the magnitude and seriousness of the COVID-19 situation. Today's statistics in South Africa tell us more than 2.8 million people have been infected, just over 2.7 million have recovered, and a little more than 87,000 have succumbed. Well, the point here is that it is real, and with the third wave, virtually everyone has been infected and affected in some way or the other. Two, Judge Griffin makes the point that given the number of infections and deaths, one would have expected most people to welcome the opportunity to get vaccinated. But what we see is vaccine hesitancy, surrounded by attitudes of complacency, convenience, and confidence. This is true in South Africa as well. In many vaccination sites, we have the vaccines, but not enough people coming forward. So we have to resort to creative ways to encourage people to get vaccinated. Three, referring to the situation in the USA, Judge Griffin speaks about the differences political leaders and parties have about approaches to addressing the COVID-19 crisis. Some even deny its seriousness and refuse vaccines. Obviously, this creates huge conflicts among citizens. In South Africa, though, political leaders and parties have expressed concerns about how the government has handled the crisis. However, they have not denied or denounced the seriousness of the situation. If politicians feel obliged to take a different view just to stand in opposition to ruling parties and score political points, they have seriously missed the boat. Human lives are not a political football and politicians would stand responsible and accountable to God for the care of God's creation. Four, another sector of people causing a great sense of anxiety, confusion, and conflict, resulting in people refusing to take the vaccine, are unfortunately doctors and health workers. The majority of people think that people in the medical field should know better about the seriousness of the crisis and the importance of vaccines to remedy the situation. And when the very people who administer solutions to health crisis refuse to take the COVID vaccine, it makes people suspicious asking, what do they know about the COVID-19 vaccines that we don't? The main medical arguments are on the efficacy, speed of manufacture, safety, and the presupposed long-term effects of the vaccine. We need to understand that vaccines are not a new thing. Most of us have grown up taking these to prevent diseases and death. Admittedly, the coronavirus is something new, but with the disruption and devastation it has brought on lives and livelihood, surely we cannot sit back and not find possible medical interventions. For now, if vaccines and non-pharmaceutical approaches are possible measures to save lives, then why resist them? Five, now I come to that sector which is the essence of this lecture today. The response of the religious leaders and communities. Judge Griffin has shown us the situation in the USA. Our conservative Christians are refusing the vaccine on religious grounds. Even knowledgeable medical people refuse the vaccine citing religious beliefs. Judge Griffin examines and responds well to the issue of personal faith as the basis for refusing to be vaccinated. He establishes the conflicts, contradictions, and false information attached to such beliefs. Some of the religious reasons not mentioned in the presentation are the mark of the beast, triple six, chips and implants under the skin to control human beings, and the endeavors to make followers of Satan and raise the profile of the Antichrist. These beliefs are not backed by scientific knowledge or tenable publicly researched. Six, 
Recently, I saw on TV a church in the United States say that it is the church for the unvaccinated. It put up a sign that said, here we have faith and no fear. I would like to suggest that this is most irresponsible. Faith does not require us to be foolish. It warrants a belief that God will do God's share and we must do ours to the glory of God and the good of others. It's like trusting God to pass an exam and refusing to study. Absolutely nonsensical. Medicine and science is not opposed to God. It is part of God's plan to help and heal the world. Seven, the focus on individual faith also raises the question, is it really about individual rights and freedom or collective responsibility for the safety and protection of all people? Here, the biblical concept of the neighbor comes to mind, which has been expanded a little bit by Judge Griffin. If the good neighbor is the one who cares for another, then, then how do we selflessly give of ourselves for the safety, health, and protection of others? Did Jesus not give up his own life on a cross for the lives of others? Only that we are called in this virus crisis not to give up our lives, but to protect it and that of others by taking the vaccine. Eight, Judge Griffin addressed the issue of making vaccines compulsory. This is a big debate in South Africa at the moment. Some companies and universities are being criticized for the position on making vaccines compulsory for staff and students. I like what Judge Griffin says about this particular aspect with regards to vaccine mandates. He says, the power to manage vaccination includes the power to accommodate individual health and liberty concerns in ways that do not jeopardize public health and safety. I repeat that, in ways that do not jeopardize public health and safety. The important thing is the protection of lives. And Judge Griffin strengthens this point when he says that those who do not take protection of lives seriously are sacrificing children, much like religious people did who practiced the ancient idolatry of worship in Molech. Nine, Judge Griffin, you invoke, and perhaps more appropriately provoke, two thoughts from Isaiah and Micah. The one relates to the issue of justice and the other on the issue of power. But Michael also tells us that we must be careful what we preach. The matter of justice has featured prominently in the unequal access to vaccines. Wealthier countries stockpiling more than they need for their population, while less advantaged countries struggle to acquire even a little of the vaccines for its people. Here, your quotation from Terman, Martin Luther King Jr. and Busak suffice to indicate that we are a global community and what affects one affects all. We should also be wary of self-proclaimed preachers leading God's people astray. In concluding, I'd like to once again express my thanks to you for your lecture, which not only presented a compel compelling case for COVID-19 vaccination, but most significantly offered a prophetic call to those who refuse to support vaccines to save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pillay. Thank you for that incisive response to the, to the presentation by Judge Griffin. We are now going to re, um, listen to Professor Elsabis Skuman, who will be doing the second response to the, to the lecture. Professor Elsabis Skuman is the Dean of our Faculty of Law, and I hand over immediately to her. Thank you, Professor Duncan, for that introduction. And thank you for Judge Griffin for a very insightful presentation. It is rare to find an expert work, walking in both areas of law and religion and who is able to talk so authoritatively on a topic such as this. In my response, I will focus on the South African position and in the main on the legal position currently in South Africa. 
We all know that the world longs for a post-COVID era, one where activities such as hugging, kissing, meeting, visiting, interacting and socialising with loved ones were the norm, not the cruel exception. An everyday occurrence without thinking about it twice, where, except for war-torn countries, travelling and movement were unrestricted, where we could literally come and go as we pleased. Now, 18 plus months down the line since COVID's haunted shadow vigorously crawled across the globe, many in the world long for their lost loved ones as a result of the destructive and suffocating death blanket of COVID covering the globe. Some survived and they long for their bodies to return to their pre-COVID healthy state. I think it is fair to say that not one of us has lived unscathed and untouched through the COVID pandemic. As stated by Honourable Judge Wendell Griffin, COVID-19 made, made globalism real in new, and if I may add, frightening ways. And yes, its attack on humanity is surely indiscriminate. In a World Bank blog entry by Carolina Sanchez Paramo of 23 April 2020 last year, she writes that, the coronavirus is a crisis like no other the world has faced in recent decades in terms of its potential economic and social impacts. We estimate that the pandemic could push about 49 million people into extreme poverty in 2020. A year and six months later, we know that fears expressed in this block have been realized and even exceeded. COVID has affected millions of households in many ways, including job losses, higher prices, rationing of food and other basic goods, and disruptions to healthcare services and education. According to the South African Human Rights Commission's chairperson, Advocate Bongani Majola, constitutional democracy is based on the foundations of equality, freedom and dignity and thus a person's decision to have the vaccine should be voluntary. The right to freedom and security of the person contained in the Bill of Rights, Chapter 2 of the Constitution, includes the right not to be subjected to medical procedures without their informed consent. The Commission emphasises that no person can be forced by anyone, including the state, to be vaccinated. Herd immunity is understood to be resistance to the spread of an infectious disease in a population based on a high proportion of individuals being immune as a result of previous infection or vaccination. Medical practitioners, the scientific community and the Department of Health would want to vaccinate 40 million people in South Africa. Those 40 million people would have to do so voluntarily. This poses the first of many human rights deliberations. Majola continues by stating that the choice to present oneself for the vaccination against COVID-19 must be based on adequate information about the vaccines. In a digital age of social media, in the post-fact era, with alternative facts being accepted and opinion becoming fact, it would be difficult for anyone to discern the truth pertaining to vaccines. In a context where vaccination campaigns have been used for insidious ends, particularly on the African continent, it is understandable that many are concerned about the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. Globally, much misinformation about vaccines and the emergence of the anti-vaxxer movement has resulted in more people opting out of being vaccinated. Juxtaposed to this, the first disease to have sparked the development of a vaccine was smallpox, which was eradicated globally in 1980. The smallpox vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner in 1796. Without it, the world would still be burdened by a disease that led to the elimination of many ethnicities in North America, a disease that had a 30% mortality rate and left most of its survivors with deep scars and some with lifelong disabilities. Today, 
contagious and potentially lethal diseases such as polio are close to being eradicated by vaccines. For people to effectively exercise their discretion in deciding whether they would be counted among the 40 million to be vaccinated and make informed choices, information campaigns need to be intensified and sustained for the duration of the vaccination process. Informed consent will ensure that we will be able to address all the other human rights problems COVID-19 has posed, the poor and marginalised, a number that has increased since quarantines and lockdowns were initiated, are most in need of a restoration and an improvement to the realisation of their socio-economic rights. A return to work and trade would ensure that the right to food, housing, education and a litany of others are closer to being realised. The Commission urges the public to make their decision based on scientific evidence from identifiable and reputable sources, as opposed to baseless claims circulating on social media and other media, all too often made by faceless, anonymous sources. The Commission also asks employers, traditional leaders, church leaders and others to follow, to allow and, where necessary, assist those who wish to get vaccinated and also to respect the choices of those who do not want to be vaccinated. It will be a violation to threaten, stigmatise, victimise and discriminate against those who choose not to be vaccinated. Majula concludes by stating that for now, vaccines are the only viable and promising way of getting rid of the pandemic in this country and globally. The Commission reiterates its call in encouraging everyone to have themselves vaccinated against COVID as vaccines are rolled out. Recently, we have seen a move towards mandatory vaccination in workplaces. Most rights in the con Constitution may be limited, provided the limitation is of general application and is reasonable and justifiable, and therefore mandatory vaccination in certain workplaces may be justified based on scientific evidence and the rights of all people to a safe environment. However, employers should strive to combat vaccine hesitancy and to provide support for better information and access to vaccination before implementing mandatory workplace vaccination policies. Professor Ames Dye of WITS University's Steve Biko Centre for Bioethics and Vice Chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee for COVID-19 has said that in balancing rights in the workplace, employers are compelled to undertake risk assessments to determine if mandatory workplace vaccination in accordance with the Occupational Health and Safety Act is a necessity. Dai writes, it must take into account the constitutional rights of the employees to bodily integrity and the right to freedom of religion, belief and opinion. Another relevant right is that everyone is entitled to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being." Unquote. Workers may refuse to be vaccinated in terms of the constitutional right to bodily integrity, the right to freedom of religion, belief or opinion and on medical grounds. However, worker rights are not absolute. Employers can still implement mandatory vaccination after conducting a risk assessment on grounds that they want to, among other things, promote a safe working environment and protect workers whose job poses a risk of exposure to COVID-19 based on their age and underlying health conditions. We have seen in the last week or so that the universities of Cape Town and the Witwatersrand are seeking to introduce mandatory vaccination for students and staff. We are also seeing the introduction of vaccination passports. Young people attending some of last year's super spreader post matric events in 2021 will be required to produce proof of vaccination. In conclusion, it is imperative that we trust the science and that everyone is sufficiently informed so that they are able to trust the science. It is important that people are persuaded by science to take the vaccine voluntarily.
This is also important longer term when we will need to be vaccinated, perhaps on a regular annual basis. And it is crucial that everybody understands how the weighing and balancing of rights work in the context of their membership of a community or in their workplace. Judge Griffin, is it not ironic that we are being forced to work together globally by this devastating pandemic? I hope that whereas wars tear us apart, the one good thing that can come from this pandemic is a focus on working together to defeat a common enemy. I want to end with a question which, which I hope will be answered in the Q&A session. Is it morally correct to entice people with vaccine passports to get vaccinated? Does it matter why you get vaccinated? Because you understand the signs? Because it is mandatory? Or because you want to attend an event? Maybe I should ask that question to Judge Griffin. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Skuman, for for that response, the second very important response to, to Judge uh, Griffin's um, input to the presentation that we that we all listened to at the beginning of the, the event this afternoon. Of course, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Skuman's um, response came from a different angle and that, uh, to that which was presented by Prof. Pillay, and that's, I believe, what, what makes, will make the, the rest of the discussion very, very lively and fruitful and enriching. In fact, that reminds me, we've got about um, seven minutes uh, before the end of, the pro, of, of this webinar, so seven minutes in which we can respond to the questions of the audience. Um, Prof. Skuman, your question was in, in fact a very good one, and I wonder whether we shouldn't kick off with that one by asking uh, uh, Judge Griffin if he wants to very briefly respond to that first question, and then we'll go to some of the questions of the audience. Thank you, Professor Duncan. Thank you, Professor Duncan. Prof. Skuman, raised is a valid one because the notion of uh, vaccine passports or enticements to get people vaccinated raises this whole issue of risk benefit analysis. What does it take in our current era to get people to save their own lives? And, and, and I, ra I think about this particularly in the way that the question was raised. The people, who, the people who are going to be enticed to get vaccinated, presumably, are the same people who have decided to trust the people who say that the vaccines are safe and effective, and have decided to distrust the people who are responsible for disinformation and misinformation. Because I cannot imagine someone deciding I'm going to be, for instance, in my country, receive a cash bonus for a vaccination if I don't think the vaccine is safe. The problem we have now is that by basically enticing people to get the vaccine, some of the people who would not get the vaccine will say, well, if it's so safe, why do you have to entice me to get it? Uh, which is, which is which is a catch twenty two. I mean, it's a very Kafkaesque kind of situation, and it 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 really highlights the 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 terrible state that policymakers are in these days. Because on the one hand, this is a global pandemic, and knows no distinctions, and so whether one is a pauper or one is an aristocrat getting some money is not going to make one more or less immune from COVID. And getting the money and taking the vaccine doesn't make one safe because one got the money. It's the vaccine that gets you the safety. And I think we have to understand that. We are not being made safe because I get a trip in, for instance, to Las Vegas. Or, or somebody offers us a trip to Las Vegas, the safety comes in the vaccine. And that's the issue of trust. Uh, I, I, we really, really are living in this post-truth age, but it's also a post-trust age. We cannot trust ourselves to tell the truth 
to each other. And we cannot trust the people who we're supposed to trust to be truthful because so many people are believing in people who have proven themselves untrustworthy despite their titles. Unfortunately, that's the problem our policymakers are in. Thank you, uh, Judge Griffin. Um, I am going to go on to uh, immediately to the next question, just given the limitations of time. I, I see we've got about four minutes left. And so I'm going to direct that question to you as well, Judge Griffin. And the question comes from the audience. And the question is as follows. What are your personal or philosophical points of view in relation to religious exemption? I happen to believe that the religious objections of people have to be treated seriously. And I also think that the religious of people, religious objections have to be given a reasonable accommodation. We cannot force people to jettison their faith, even in the face of an, Ill, an, a, a, an illness. That faith, however, has to be lived in context in a community. I do not have the right to practice my faith in ways that basically threaten the safety of my neighbor. I have the right to have a faith, but my faith does not give me the right to sicken my neighbor or to expose my neighbor to the risk of illness, particularly my vulnerable neighbor, my child neighbor, who cannot get a vaccine because the vaccines have not been effective for her. And so I have an obligation to use my faith in ways that say, yes, is it just faith to claim that I am going to trust God to keep me safe when God has made the provision for a vaccine that would keep me safe and I can practice my trust in God by taking the vaccine as a measure of my trust in God? I think that's the kind of thing that I would say to a person as a faith leader. I would not as a judge subject that person to an exam about that. However, I do note, and I'll say this very quickly, I do note that some of the people who claim religious objections have been vaccinated for other conditions, polio, measles, mumps, chicken pox, whooping cough, and so, I find that the, the faith claims have been somewhat, somewhat over-exaggerated. Thank you, Judge Griffin. I'm going to ask, given the fact that we've got about two minutes left, I'm going to ask both our respondents if they want to make a, a last statement, a last reflection on the presentation or the, the, the debate around, around vaccination. Uh, starting with you, Prof. Pillay. Thank you, Chair. I think it's a critical question at the moment in terms of the vaccines and people are divided about should they or should they not take it. And the concern of course is with regards to the legal aspects but also to religious aspects. And very often when people put forward religious objections or reasons for not taking the vaccine, they need to think more holistically, more broadly and more circumstantially in terms of what happens to others concept of the good neighbor, for example, as you explained, Judge, is a very good concept to understand that. Because when we talked about religious exemption, the question is, what constitutes religious exemption? And that's a very critical question that needs to be interrogated. But if religious exemption is a reference to doctrine, one needs to look at that. But if religious exemption is related to personal views and personal subject uh, decisions, the critical question then is, how does it affect my neighbor? And when we're looking at the issue of vaccines, I think we have to take the broad perspective. Even from a religious point of view, we need to see quite clearly what impact does this have on society and how does it actually protect lives or actually destroy lives. When we interrogate those particular questions, then I think that should help us to understand whether vaccination or not. Thank you so much, Prof. Pillay. There's one minute left for you, Prof. Skuman, if you've got a last comment. I'll be brief. Though I am a lawyer, I'll be brief, Chair. <laughs> so I just want to um, link on to the, the principle of the neighbour. We have to be very, very responsible neighbours. But I do believe that it is better 
to get the vaccine voluntarily. So I would really emphasize the information campaigns so people can believe the science and then get vaccinated. I would like to believe that um, getting vaccinated voluntarily is much better than being um, compelled to get vaccinated. And I would like people to go that route first before we institute mandatory vaccinations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Prof Skuman. And that brings me to my half a minute to wrap up everything. And I'm gonna use that half a minute to firstly thank Judge Griffin for that very instructive presentation. A uh, presentation that told, uh, that in fact in the, informs us that this issue is quite complex. And that's reflected obviously in the response by Professor Pillay and the response by Professor Skuman. I mean, we've got, we approach the, the issue from two angles, namely a religious or the, a theological angle and also from a legal angle. And both those responses indicate how deeply complex the issue of vaccination and related matters are. Of course, I must finally thank Professor Buzak for having um, organize uh, the, the, this lecture and, and the next one to follow or had been instrumental in organizing it. And I also thank him for his um, input at the beginning of the of this webinar. To all our viewers, I say um, 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 for, for those in South Africa, um, enjoy the rest of, of the day. Um, to the viewers elsewhere in the, in, uh, in the world, um, thank you for having joined us and the rest, uh, enjoy the rest of your day as well. Uh, Good night from South Africa, and I'm sure for the rest of the world, it might be a good afternoon or, or, um, or good morning. Cheers.